Okay, so this is day two of Mishle 21 23. We'll review as we usually do. Shomer Piv Ulashono, Shomer Mitsaros Nafsha, one who guards his mouth and tongue, guards his soul from troubles or distresses. Okay, so our questions were question one, it's obvious or it's not obvious. <laughs> okay, so either, <clears throat> either it is obvious. That was what some of us thought. Others of us thought it's not obvious because it's so general that, like, what is it getting at? You know, like, it's hard to even, like, have a foothold. Okay. Two, what is Shmira in this context? How do you do it? Right? Do you just not say anything? Do you not, whatever, like, you know, cover your mouth? Three, how does it work? Uh, meaning, how does the Shmira guard your mouth and, uh, and, Sorry, how does guarding the mouth and tongue guard you from Saros Nafsho? And what level of this guarding of the mouth and the tongue do you need in order to guard yourself from the, the Saros Nafsho? Right? Like what, what's the what's the degree? Um, okay, three, uh, four. Who what is he guarding his mouth and tongue from? Right? Uh, that's part of the question about how it's so vague. Five. This is the big question. What is nefesh in this context? So we said that there's four standard meanings to nefesh, okay? Like in Tanakh Hebrew. One is just another word for himself, just the entire self. Two is nefesh is like biological life, like your ability to live or to die. Three is your animalistic soul, your, your, your taivas, your desires. And then four is your intellect. Okay, those are the four, uh, four ways that nefesh is used in Tanakh. Six, what are the Saros Nafsho? What are they? Seven, what is the difference between Piv and Lashono, if such a difference exists? And eight, who is the audience? Okay, so the main approach we worked on yesterday was Mati's approach, which was, um, so our notes were that it's talking about guarding your mouth from eating and your tongue from speaking, okay? And we, our theory was that, that eating whatever is in front of you and saying whatever comes to your mind is a very, um, uh, very easy way to make impulsive decisions. Right, like you, you don't even have to think about it. You just like grab whatever appeals to you, or you just say whatever's on your mind. So if you don't exercise that type of impulse control, then it will lead to two harms, two two tiers of harms. Tier one is it will weaken your impulse control. That was one type of, of affliction of the soul. And then the fact that you lack impulse control will also lead to other problems. Okay, so um, I saw. Two Mepharshim who support this, one who supports it indirectly, the other one who supports it like exactly. So the one who supports it indirectly is Rubin and Yonah. So if you look at Rubin and Yonah, left column, Chav Gimel. Shomer people, Shomer, Shomer, Misaros, Nafsho. Gam, Ze, Nismach, Le'inian, Hachacham. So this is also attached to the idea of the Chacham, the subject of the Chacham, who was in the previous Pasuk. The previous Pasuk said, Ir giborim ala chacham biyored oz miktecha, that a chacham goes into the city of, of uh, heroes or mighty people and brings down the strength of its, of its, uh, of its security. So he says, um, ki, yo, ki od imo gvura atsuma min ha lamala. The chacham has a, another type of gvura greater than the gvura mentioned above. So the great the gvura mentioned above is the physical strength of the city. And, and we were saying that basically the chacham, through his strategizing, can defeat like a physically strong you know, army. Okay, but Ravina is saying more so, he says, Ki achacham moshel batavaso. A chacham can rule over his desires. Uh, uksiv, because it's written in another Mishlei Pasuk, umoshel beruchel milofet ir. Someone who, who can conquer his rule over his spirit is greater than someone who captures a city. And that's the Pasuk that Pirke Alvas quotes where it says, Ezehu gibor hakovish as yitzra, who is mighty, who is strong, someone who can conquer his, uh, his, his uh, yitzra. Yeah, who can subdue his yitzra. Okay, so in other words, not only can you bring down an actual city, but you can you can even conquer your own desires. So the even means that conquering your desires is much more difficult. So then he goes on and he says, yeah. Uh, Chachma gives the power to the soul to rule over his taivas. As it is uh, written by Chachma, so he quotes a bunch of psukim where Chachma protects you from taiva. To guard you from an uh, evil woman. To guard you from an evil woman. <laughs> to save you from an evil woman. <laughs> okay, a strange woman. Um, okay, now, the, so, so, so far this is... Uh, in line with our approach that it's about impulse control, but then check this out. Ubira Enyan, Shomer Piv Lashono, Shomer Piv Min Achalim Harayim. You guard your mouth from bad foods, okay, presumably unhealthy foods. 
This is one of the levels in precious, which means I, I hate how English translations translate as abstinence because that has a very like Christian or Catholic like connotation. Precious means like separating yourself from pleasures or from desires. Um, you should only eat what is good for your nefesh. So here he is learning nefesh as your biological life. Okay, like what's healthy for you. So moderation is a better word. For so it. moderation, I think, is a different quality. Moderation, moderation is sounds like what he was talking about before, right? Actually, no, no, I take it back. Moderation is a good is a good word for it. I don't know because well, did you use the word temperance yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Right. So I, I feel like there's different subtle terms. One has to do with like just controlling your desires regardless of what your needs are. But then there's another quality of doing only what you need. That, so that requires self-control. Prudence. Yeah, yeah. It's like a prudence for, uh, for, for biological needs. I, I don't know what, what English word we have for that, but yeah, concept is more important than the word. Uh, and you shouldn't go after uh, pleasures. Um, therefore, therefore, he leaves aside excesses and bad foods. Okay, so I mentioned that there's a, a treat for Mati, okay, because you know who says his interpretation outright? Because this is so far seems like his interpretation. From left field, the Rambam, okay, who doesn't even have a commentary on Mishle. But in Hilchos Deos, in the parak about health, listen to what he says. He says, Rov hachalaim habayin al ha'adam enon elami pnei ha'machalim rayim. This is in Hilchos Deos 4, 4, uh, 4, sorry, 4, 15. Okay. The majority of illnesses only come upon a person because of bad foods. Okay. Because of uh, unhealthy foods. And again, uh, you know, obviously a lot of the stuff that the Ramam wrote is uh, uh, in health is outdated. This one's not. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, either because he he just wants to fill his belly and he eats with achilas gasa, which we would, uh, I, I finally realized this morning uh, uh, that we have a term for achilas gasa in English. I just never made the connection. What do you call achilas? Uh, those of you who know what achilas gasa is? It's gluttony, yeah. So gluttony is like the vice, is like the imperfection, but the activity we call binge eating. Oh. Right? Like where you just like, like, like eat just tons of junk food or like tons of like whatever, you know? Um, even of good foods. So if you binge eat even healthy foods, then that's going to bring on illnesses. Who Shlomo Omer Bechachma? So this is what Shlomo said in his Chachma. What was that? With a bandit, yeah. Shomer Piv Ulashono, one who guards his mouth and tongue. Shomer Mitzaros Nafsho guards himself from afflictions of the soul. Kolomar means to say, Shomer Piv Milecho Mahal Ra Umilispoa. He guards his mouth from eating unhealthy foods or from uh, from satiating himself, meaning like stuffing himself. And he guards his, his tongue from speaking except for that which he needs. Now, the amazing thing about this is the Ram talked about speech in chapter two of Hilchos Deos uh, about like uh, how you should minimize speech. And we had a whole bunch of shiram on that last year. The funny thing is that the Ram puts this into the Pasuk about, um, what do you call, about, uh, about eating and then the Perak about health okay um so so in other words like you could have explained see what I, if you read Rabbeinu and yona that this is just about guarding your mouth from uh, unhealthy foods how would you interpret guarding your tongue that would be speech then. no according to Rabbeinu and yona oh if you just did according to Rabbeinu and yona like just his thing about uh because he says show more people to show no show more people in Halim harayim so he explains what guarding your mouth is but he doesn't explain tongue so how would you explain tongue according to Rubin Yona's approach? What does he say for mouth? He, so he says, I'll just say it in English. One who guards his mouth from unhealthy foods. Uh, this is one of the higher levels of self-control that a person only eats what's necessary for the preservation of his, of his uh, like what his body needs. And he is not drawn after uh, like indulgences or pleasures. And therefore he will, uh, he will uh, forego excesses and unhealthy foods. So you can get anything outside of Torah. He didn't say anything about speech. You're drinking, you're drinking wine. Okay, so I, I think that according to being, you know, you'd have to take it as tongue is taste. Okay, right? That's what you do with your tongue, right? There's two things you do with your tongue. You speak and you taste. Okay, so I think that's why he doesn't even have to explain tongue because that's what draws you after the pleasures, right? Um, and I think psychologically there are two pleasures. There is a stuffing yourself 
Uh, like, I think the proof of that is when you do find yourself, sometimes you find yourself stuffing yourself and you're like, I'm not even like stopping to enjoy what I'm eating, you know? Uh, but then clearly the taste plays a role also. So the fact that Rabbeinu Yona takes this to be entirely about eating and the Rambam takes it to be about eating and speaking shows that like there is a approach like that with like what, what you know what Muddy was saying. So now we have to just unpack it a little bit more. Uh, we, we started to develop it yesterday, but like, uh, just let me just start with the question again. So, so how does, what's the, what perfection do you get or what harms do you avoid from only eating what you need and only saying what you need that are in common or, or what, what would the possibility be saying? Yeah, let's go. Um, it seems like the question of how are you guarding it? Like, what, how do you guard That's it? also what we need to answer, correct. Yeah. yeah. It seems like that Rambam, I would say his answer is more, seems like it contain that because this, he's kind of addressing this. So he said it does or does not contain that? Does. Yeah. His contains it better because he's showing a function of both coming in and, and leaving. Right. Um, and so there's already like, okay, like there's sort of a, really a, a seems to me like a greater marshal of like what you consume or there's content or whatever in general that you take into you is going to affect what, you know, comes out of you. Um, I feel like I could take it, I could expand his uh, principles to that. Interesting. So let's actually, I think just to see where he's coming from, not that we need to limit ourselves to that. Let's just review really quickly without going into the whole sugya, what he says about how you should and shouldn't speak. Um, Again, we spent, if you're interested in the shirim on that, uh, we spent a while on that last year. Um, raise this. Okay, so he says in Hilvos Deus 2.4, yarbe adam bishtika. You should always increase your silence. Okay, which is a strange, this is one of the things we remarked on is like silence would seem to be an abs- a, a lack of a thing. So increase your silence is, uh, you know, is, is an interesting lashon. Yeah, be more quiet, right? Velo yidabir ella o bidvar chachma you should either you should only speak about two categories of things either chachma right which includes chachma of torah and chachma of other stuff and things that you need for your bodily life and bodily life means also like your practical needs right um you don't have to go to like you know the dmv and like try to communicate without speaking uh amru al rav they said about rav tamid rabino kadosh the student of rabino kadosh he didn't speak any Null conversation or any like wasted conversation in his entire life. The Zohi Sichas Rov Kolodim, and that is the conversation of the majority of people, right? Senseless speech um, or a, 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 a pointless speech. And even in the bodily needs, when you're talking about bodily needs, you shouldn't speak excessively about them. This is what Chachamim said. Uh, the more you speak, the more you increase faith. If you need to use your phone for some uh, practical purpose, you can do it outside. And if it's for Fakma, then then yeah. just tell me. Okay. Okay. Um, the more you uh, increase speech, then the more you bring on faith. I found nothing better for the body than speech. So that's emphasizing that it has an impact on your bodily life, which is a weird thing, right? I can understand how it brings about like um, psychological troubles, like in initially last night, but what about your bodily life? And then he says one, uh, okay, just a couple more things, just again, setting the stage here. So to in divrei Torah and divrei chachma, yihu divrei hachachm ma'atim v'inyanehem merubim. The words of hachacham should be few and their ideational content should be abundant, meaning say a lot in a few words. Like the wrong one, or Shlomo. This is what. Sorry, hold on just a second. Pause the recording. Um, okay, so uh, then he says, um, Adam. A person should always teach his student in a concise manner. If the words are many and the ideas are few, this is foolishness. As it says uh, in Kohelas, that a dream comes in an abundance of worry or concern and the voice of a fool is in an abundance of words. Okay, one more. Um, a fence around Chachma is silence, meaning you'll protect your chachma if you're silent. Therefore, you should not be quick to respond. And you should not be uh, abundant to speak. I'm really bad at this. You should teach your your uh, your students in a gentle 
manner, and not like like uh, like shouting out, and not very uh, um, expansive in your language. I fail on all three accounts. I, I'm not calm when I uh, when I teach. I, I'm very loud and I say a lot of words. <laughs> so I got to work on that. Who's your Shlomo Omer? This is what uh, Shlomo means when he says, The words of a Chachamim are uh, heard in gentleness. Yeah, okay. I don't know if I, like, just, I, I, don't know if I completely agree with that. I don't know, agree with that so much. That, that's so how you should teach? Types of personalities. Yeah, you do have different types of personalities. Yeah, like um, I, I always think of, um, of I'm going to pause this. Isaac, do you remember where he talks about the, like, I, there is a thing where he talks about specifically about the, the manner that the Rav speaks in, and I think he does say, like, shouting like an animal. Uh, uh, he says he shouldn't do that. I, is it in Talmud Torah? I'm not recalling, but I'm, um, I'm uh, guessing that, that would be where it would be. So yeah. Like shouting, shouting like an animal? Um, uh, like talking loud versus some shot like that. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I, I want to see. I want to see if I can find it and see what he says. Maybe I'm, I'm misquoting it. Um, he says, "Let's see here." No. Uh, where would it be? Would it be in Hillos Deos? Maybe. Maybe it's in Hillos Deos in the conduct of Tamida Fachamim. He talks about how they should conduct themselves. If I can't find it, then we'll uh, uh, I'll, I'll find it later on. But I, I, I am agreeing with the quality you're saying. I'm just questioning whether the Raman uh, means that. Uh, where does he talk about conduct of Chacham in, in, in five, I think? Uh, yeah. Keita Tami, Garan, okay. Oh, he talks about the eating here too. I forgot. Uh, Rosho, Oh, here we go. Yeah. Tamil Chachamim, a Tamil Chacham, Lo Yehe Soik Betzavach Bashas Diburo. He shouldn't um, scream and shout at the time of his speech, Kabehemos Ukachaios, like domesticated or like wild animals. Lo Yagbia Kolo Bioser. He shouldn't raise his voice, you know, more than necessary. Ella Diburo Benachas in Kolobrios. He should speak gently with all people. Ukishi Yidabra Benachas. And when he speaks gently, he should be careful to not distance himself to the point where he seems like he's haughty. Um, he should greet, preemptively greet every person so that they should, um, they're, uh, they, they should be pleased with him. And you should judge every person favorably. Um, uh, he should speak uh, of the praise of his fellow and not speak of his degradation at all. He should love peace and pursue peace. So uh, again, I, I, we, we can, uh, it's up for debate, I think, about how to read that Rambam in the, uh, the Deus we read. But I think I was associating that he uses the word sa'ak and nachas here and is clearly here talking about volume. So I assumed that the same was true there, but it's, I'm acknowledging that it's possible that, you know, that, that he means like the manner in which you come across as like yeah. how much you're forcing your ideas or how much you're, yeah. Those are more than necessary. More than necessary, correct, yeah. Oh, so the whole reason why I wanted to quote the Rambam in Deus here in four, in four, yeah, when he's talking, sorry. In the Ramam's parish on our Pasuk, uh, I want to quote this for two reasons. One, and I want to go over the halachas in chapter two, because, uh, thank you, to show that, um, number one, when the Ramam is talking about the Mida of silence and about not saying more than necessary, uh, he means both in terms of what, co what content you say, and then even in the content that's good, then uh, only doing what's necessary. And that applies to speech and that applies to eating. And I wanted to say this in response also to what Chizkiah who said that you, you were saying that there's an idea of like uh, the intake that you have will, will affect your outtake. That is definitely true. But what's interesting is that in the Rambam's entire treatment of shtika, of like that mita of, of being silent, he doesn't really talk about what you listen to. He really talks only about how you use your faculty of speech. So in if, if our goal is to understand the pasuk, then you can interpret it as what you listen to is going to impact what you say. My objection to that would be the same as my objection to you yesterday, which is that the puzzle doesn't focus on, listen, on, on like listening, it only focuses on speaking. But if we're taking the Rambam, definitely he focuses only on what you say. 
So now let's just center back on our, our, our original um, Mati and Rambam approach, which is um, what is the relationship between these two things about uh, saying and eating only what you need and avoiding excess speech and excess food or stuffing yourself with speech, sorry, with food or stuffing yourself with speech, which would be like, just like, like indulging and just like loving to hear yourself talk. Yeah. Well, the answer is very simple. It's just self-control. Right. So I do think that that was the, that this is also why I led with the Rubina Yona um, because I think Rubina Yona has good theory that gvura, true gvura so there's two types of, there's three types of gura. There's pure physical strength, okay? Which could either be in the body or like military strength. Then there's the gvura of overtaking that strength through your chachma strategizing, which we did in the last pasuk. And then there's gvura over your own taivas, which is what Chazal say is the true gvura. And so I think the fact that the first half of the pasuk mentions, um, sorry, the previous pasuk mentions gvura means that I agree with Ben Yonah's move that this is the, the, the subject here is Gavura and saying that the key to Gavura, to, to developing Gavura, is exercising Gavura in self restraint, in eating and in speaking. Now, it might be just because of what I said yesterday everyone needs to eat and everyone needs to speak, right? But there are other areas of exercising um, restraint over your taiva that are big tests, but you're not doing it on a daily basis, right? Like, let's say, like with, um, you know, like, you know, uh, again, Hillis Deus or Hillis, you know, Safer Kedusha, Ramam has a lot of stuff about, you know, the strongest taiva, arguably, well, not arguably, I think it's strongest taiva is like sexual, right? But that's not something that you're doing like three times a day or every moment of the day. And if you do, then like, that's a different problem, you know, but like, like, you need to eat every day, you need to talk with people at every moment of your life. So it's a very good, like, opportunity to always be in the gym working out your, uh, your, uh, your Kafma muscle, your, uh, you know, so what's your point? Is this a? Are you, are so my, my point you, is that I'm, or is a I am agreeing. I'm saying oh, that this okay. is about. I'm trying to support you though. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, okay. that that this is about gavura, and it's saying that the two chief areas to develop gavura are in terms of how, how you relate to your eating and how you relate to your right. speaking, because they are constant things that you're being tested with at every moment. Yeah. Or every more, every time of the day. Yeah. More common. Yeah. yeah. Like with the sexual. Thing, like right. How often do you have the opportunity? Exactly. To that that's going to be so. That's going to be tested. Or it's going to be tested in terms of in a particular relationship, or in selecting who you have a relationship with. You know, or when the taiva is awakened. You know, but not on a constant basis. Thoughts. Like right. But the thing is, is I feel like the the battle. Okay, this is going to be a distinction that you might um, dismiss. Uh -huh. It's true that that sexual thoughts are in the realm of like this battle. But I think what he's talking about here is when you have the like it's a question of decisions that you make. Do I eat this or do I not eat this? You know, do I say this or do I not say this? Actions. Actions, right. So in the realm of the sexual, you know, then it's true that abundant hirhurim could lead to putting yourself in situations where you're going to act. But I think the, 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 the struggle with your hurim mm -hmm. is not this struggle. I think it's like a, a prior struggle or a different type of struggle. Like here does not lead directly to action. You know, here leads to an obsession or preoccupation and a diverting of energies. And, and that's like a, uh, and that needs to be worked on, but that's not like a, that's not, I, I wouldn't call that a Gavura thing. I don't know. It seems like in Kedushin, like it was a problem enough that it was considered in and of itself an obstacle to learning you know like it doesn't need to become anything more than it's already a distraction from learning right so it's already affecting other minds right um but is that this type of self-control is that like you know like 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 to me my understanding of, of like this type of pre that we're talking about is your actual decision to indulge in the thing here who is prior to that you know, is like, oh, right. We talked about that. We talked about like, if there's different kinds of like, any, and that was what it was. It's like, no, contemplating and like focusing on these thoughts is yeah. the kind of here for they were discussing. There was like two qualities, there's like two levels of here for Yeah. And he was like, we're not, yeah, we're not talking, blaming you for the ones that are coming, right. And passing, right. But it becomes a problem. It's what, when you're really calling it here for it's when it's, it's when it's something that like you're constantly dwelling on. Right. Um, so maybe, you're right in the first one that that's not really like the kind of but but i'm also saying something more than that. i'm saying that the the strategy you use for that is not a strategy of of exercising self-control 
the in, in the same way as when you there's a, 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 a junk food okay. that you just abstain from. I think there are methods where people try to do that, like where they just try to like force the thoughts out of their mind. Maybe it's just because I don't think that those uh, are, are really successful. I think it has to do with more of how you relate to that area in general and what you do with your energy otherwise. Um, I think it's a different area. And look, there are tons of people in Michelin that deal with that because- You're saying what works here in this case is literally just saying, no, it works. You can prevent yourself from doing it, but you can't just, you have to replace it in the case of your or something else. I think so, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, yeah. David. Separate question. Yeah. Uh, with the read that we're having right now, which, what's the take on, we have on Nafsho? So Rabinu, Yona, and Ramam are both saying Nafsho is your, your physical health, right? Uh, are also explaining to other definitions? Or, or so we're, we're not excluding that in the sense that I think the thing we said yesterday about how the deliberate ambiguity of Nefesh is, is opening the path to saying that if you don't take care of your health, then you're going to have many other things that are going to plague you. Like you're going to, it's going to affect, let's say like, you know, like um, like the Ramam says in Hevos Deos, um, I did not intend for today to be a, a, a Ramam Bikius morning here, but it is. Hoyol uh, Vafayas Haguf Bari Vishalim Midarke Hashem Hu. This is in 4 1. Since the uh, healthy and intact body is one of the Darke Hashem, is uh, like one of the ways that you um, you serve Hashem. Shari Ef Shar Shiyavin Oyeda Vuchol, because you cannot be involved in understanding and knowing, like in learning, if you are sick. You need to distance yourself from things which are harmful to the body. And you need to accustom yourself to things which bring health and wellness. So, so in other words, it will affect your nefesh if you don't take care of your body. And let's, let's, here's common examples, right? Let's say you don't get enough sleep. It's definitely going to affect your learning. If you don't get enough good foods, right? If you don't eat healthy, then it's going to affect your, your, your learning. You know, if you've got like digestive problems, you know, like it's going to be distracting. You know, if you have, um, if you uh, eat foods that promote inflammation, you're going to be in bodily pain. You know, all of these things will harm your in intellect nefesh as well as your body nefesh, you know, and it will bring upon you other, other problems as well. For example, like, you know, the fact that uh, America's big epidemic is is um, obesity largely from sugar, that is going to create hospital bills, you know, and shorten life and like, 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 you know, physical disabilities later on in life that are going to affect your, your, your enjoyment in life also, you know, so I think it, it, the PUSB does use the deliberate ambiguity to open up other avenues of health, but it sounds like both the Ramam and the Ravina Yona are learning the word nefesh to mean like physical well-being. Right. Yeah. Okay, shall we do Rubenu? Uh, no, Rubenu. Should we do the Meiri? That was a rhetorical question. Let's do the Meiri. Okay, Meiri. Reason why we didn't do the Meiri last time was because it was on both Psukim. Okay, the um, the Ir Giborim and our Pasuk. So I haven't actually read the Meiri yet. So he says, um, uh, "This is oh, sorry. Yeah, it's on. Uh, it's on the next one also. Okay, so we got we got to wait. Uh, yeah, all right, fine. So let's who else, who else can we do here? Uh, let's do Sadiga On. How did Sadigon translate our puzzle in a weird way, right? He did not have it. Oh, he didn't have it. Oh, so we didn't know. Okay, fine. So let's look up Sadigon. Uh, and then we'll look up the Malvin. I don't know why I want to do Sadigon. Um, what was that? Uh, oh, did we? Um, it's possible we didn't. Let's check. Uh, Matsuz David, you're right. We usually go to him first. Matsuz David. Oh, I opened him twice. Matsuz David says Shomer Piv Mila Harbos Devarim. So he says it's entirely about speaking from being excessive in speech. Shomer Gomer, Kim Yarbe Amarim, if you increase your statements, your speech, Lo Yachtal Mi Daber Pasha, the Chote Nafsho, you will not um, cease from saying, uh, making an error in speech. Uh, from misspeaking and you'll sin against your soul. So that that I think is a, a common idea that um uh that yeah what's shot like how, what does he mean that it, that if you speak a lot then you're inevitably going to make a mistake like why is that necessarily the case <laughs> the odds okay so one 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 possibility is it's just the odds that if a person were to not speak at all no way they're going to make a mistake if you only say one sentence a day you're probably going to think about it a lot more the more you speak the more you're opening up to the odds of, of making a mistake yeah. That seems to be like an unequivocation about what's coming out of your mouth. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Un by unequivocation? Okay. That, like, we all have like the regular daily speech or like things that are like make sense to be talking about, like going to the DMV, like, yeah. Uh, 
But then if you don't think about the way you talk to the guy at DMV versus anything else, you just speak anything. Right. Then bad speech, good speech, it's all the same. Right. Kind of so it's the unfilteredness specifically yes. that leads to the error, yeah. right? And I think that that is different than the odds. I think the odds is one interpretation. The more times you do it, the more mistakes you're going to make. Second is abundant speech indicates lack of filter and lack of filter is what allows these mistakes to creep in. Yeah. Just like tying that into like current events, I think uh, like a lot of, for example, like politicians will often, because they're the ones speaking the most. And yeah. Speaking the most, and they're also the ones who have like the binoculars on them reading for some piece of right <laughs> that's true that's a good point so right. it'll it'll almost be like filtered out and it's um how the since they're speaking more they're more likely to make a mistake and more likely to say something okay like so I, I think you're, you're so that is with the odds but you're introducing a new thing also which is the more you speak the more that ears are on you and eyes are on you and the more scrutiny you will have uh, just because you're always blabbering, you know. I don't know if that did in speaking a lot or more of it did in just being a high status. Or... Right, right. Yeah, I think it is true more with more high status, but I think that um, uh, there is an element of it to uh, like you know, like I feel like in everyone's high school experience, there's always someone in the grade who, at least one person in the grade who just like talks a lot, and like you could probably think of more instances where they, you know. Um, where they said something they shouldn't have said. Again, part of it is the odds thing, but part of it is just because like people are, they're on people's radar because they're always speaking a lot, you know? Yeah. There's maybe another thought with that also. If someone is, someone just speaks a lot, then people will stop listening to them. There's like comments, I mean, I'm just thinking like that kid, right? Yeah. Like, people just stop listening to them. And then they start saying like more inflammatory or like things that like get people all riled up so that people start listening to them yeah. because they constantly want people hearing them. And then they'll start saying things that are hotly type of thing. Right. Just to get people to listen to them. Right. That's also meaning it will the the situation of being an abundant speaker or loving to hear yourself speak will lead to you intentionally saying things that are more provocative or more like like okay. like uh, get more attention and then that could be a, a cause of fate. Yeah. yeah like, my only question on the material stuff is that if we're defining like Peeve and Lashona as being speech related terms, um, it doesn't seem to be saying it's like. Michelle doesn't seem to be the public. It's not saying limit your speech, it's saying guard your speech. Right. So the question is, what's the guarding, right? right. Yeah. So that's why I like the filtering approach um, uh, because that is a type of guarding, right? Like just think before you speak. Um, is there a type of guarding you could do just from the quantity? Or is that just like a, an abstract ideal, but you wouldn't call it guarding? I don't question. In other words, David was suggesting that that the problem that these people have is that they speak without thinking. Like the thought comes into their mind and it goes out of their mouth before they like assess it, you know? Right. Guarding against that would be asking yourself like, should I say this or should I not? What is gonna be the consequence, okay? The problem you were saying of like that a person just speaks a lot, they're gonna make more mistakes. How do you rectify that problem? Do you just tell the person to speak less? If so, well, it might address the problem, but like, is that guarding? Like what, or how does that work? Like, can you really tell someone to speak less? Yeah. I think one way that could work is if someone just like, they constantly feel themselves like about to speak. Yeah. And just quantitatively just tell myself like, I'm not, just don't let yourself speak. Right. Not whether or not, is this a good thing to say or not? Right, right. Just have like a little pure blue restraint. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, pure, pure restraint. Right. I think that would be some way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good technique. I'm just trying to think like, does that actually work with someone who has this problem? Someone who's addicted to speaking, like, just don't, <laughs> you know, like, like usually just don't strategies don't work so well. Stop it. Yeah. Right. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's think about that. Uh, I want to check out side you own, uh, in what paragraph am I in? Uh, I am in paragraph 11. So let's go, let's ballpark it. 140. Oh, thank you. That's right. You know the number. Um, show more people to show. Let's see what he says. Uh, okay, so he says the, the harshest suffering and the harshest destruction are three types. Okay. The mouth in seeking food and drink. The every hamin that's a euphemism, right? Uh, the the uh, I think that's a euphemism. Um, yeah, it is. Bedishas attachment, like the sexual organ in seeking sex. The third, halashan beribui tenuaso, 
<laughs> the tongue in its abundant movement. I don't think he means like like that. Uh, I think he means like like uh, speaking ubituyo es mishiyesh believe and expressing whatever's in the mind. Okay, so those are the three things that will destroy you. Okay, uh, if you give free reign to them. Uh, your what you eat, uh, how you like what your sexual pursuits are, and uh, and what you say. Uh, saying what's on your mind. And those all contribute to... He's saying it, it contributes to the worst types of harm. Mm -hmm. I don't know where he's getting it from. That, that's what he's saying. I mean, it, it rings true, yeah. right? I mean, you know, like with the Rambam saying that most sicknesses are brought on by bad diet. Like, I think that's definitely true. You know, whatever you eat is going to affect you physically. Sexual stuff is going to affect you in terms of like the social and the relationship and Taiva in general. Like that's going to that's going to, you know, lead to a bunch of areas. Then speech also in the social and in like causing maximum harm and, uh, and stuff. The Hishmit Khan has Karas Abraham Min. I was wondering that. He says, and it omits here how you use your sexual organ. Because he already talked about it at length at the beginning of the book. Okay, that was the whole stuff about guarding against the uh, the, the foreign woman. Here it's speaking about the mouth. Asher Bonasis. So that's like Mati and the Raman were saying also. Here's talking about the mouth, which is involved in eating and involved in speaking. All who guard their mouth will, will guard their soul from afflictions. Okay, politics, right? I mean, back then it was with the king, right? Saying stuff that's going to anger the king um, and the judges. Okay, meaning like the people who are in charge of the city. Okay, or modern day example would be like your boss, right? Uh, I don't think most of the stuff that we say like gets the wrath of the president or the uh, the, the magistrates, you know. Ulam haba meish gehenom, and it'll save you from uh, the fire of gehenom in ulam haba. Okay. Uh, I I would guess if I had to guess that he's using the word nefesh in a broad way also, because he's saying for this world and the next world. Okay, let's look at the mobbing. Yeah. So it's saying that. You want to guard your speech to prevent like anger from the king and the shakti. Yeah, in Olam Hazeh and then in Olam Haba from divine wrath. Assuming that it's like a just king and just no, I don't think so. I think he's talking about the majority of kings that we have in um in Jewish history, where uh, and not just kings, but he also says shoftim, which I assume are like the local rulers. That very easy if like word gets around that you said something that could be interpreted in a negative light by like the local government, and they'll come after you. Not, I wouldn't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like take. Socrates, for example, who or turned out pretty bad for him. Right, <laughs> yeah, for right, him, right. Still, like, we're pursuing like truth. Right, but that's that's talking about a proper use of speech. If you're going to be persecuted for a proper use of speech, then like teaching Torah or like philosophy, right. you know, then like that's a decision you have to make. But that is a good thing. Here he's talking about speaking uh, in the wrong way. You know, saying stuff that's going to upset the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or in modern day example would be getting canceled. Yeah. Right. Like, like, you know, one stray remark could get you your totally destroy your career. You know? Yeah. Let's go. Um, and the question of if Nefesh means body or whatever, um, if they're if usually when they, if they are meaning soul, would they just use more like the Neshama or do they? So if you use Neshama, then Neshama, <laughs> it's fine. Neshama also means a bunch of things uh -huh. um, because Neshama means either um, like, uh, Nishmasheim or all the words for, for uh, what do you call it? For soul mean breath or air. Okay, so Neshama means soul, but also means Nishima means a breath, you know? Uh, and and nefesh, so, like, nefesh. nefesh also means uh, means to breathe. Like, uh, um, uh, it's just less common. So, uh, like, let's say, for example, uh, the easiest, most accessible puzzle that we all know is at the end of uh, Pesukah de Zimra, the last puzzle in Sefer Talon, Kol HaNeshama Tehalaliyah, Hallelujah. Every Neshama should praise God. So there are some of who would say it means that every breath you take should should praise God. And that's referring to like your biological life, like with every breath. And others say Neshama means intellect, that you should use your intellect to praise God. You know, so there'd be ambiguity there also. Uh, which is funny, like, you know, that's why the Ram says that the Ram in Hilchos Yisodia Torah chapter four defines the term nefesh versus neshama. But then he says, these are the definitions, but you need to each, you learn each term in its context because it means everything's based on the context. So there's no definitive like litmus test for knowing what it means. Okay, so it's, so there's no, it's like a, 
a misconception to feel like usually that the shaman does tend to be more on the soul. Than soul, soul so soul. there are, so there's a, uh, so, okay. So there's a, there's a trio of Rishonim, Rabinu Bahia, uh, a, a quadro or, or, or tetro. Something crazy going on there. I don't know. <laughs> Rabinu Yona, Ibn Ezra, Rabinu Bahia, and oh, no, it's a trio. Those Four three. Pet. What? Quartet. 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 Thank you. That's a music term. I should know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, th those three Rishonim, um, who I think there's some student relation, uh, uh, student teacher relationship, like right. Masora there. <laughs> yeah. No. So they all learn that nefesh means animalistic soul, uh -huh. ruach means cycle, the psyche, right. and then shama means the intellect. Right. That's and they're very emphatic about that. That's fine. Yeah. Right. So that that's they say that it is like that. I don't know if they mean that in every single case. But but they they do assert that like that's the meaning that you should go to, you know. Ramam says nefesh means intellect, neshama means biological life force, and then ruach. I've never seen the Ramam define ruach. So he switches it. He switches it, yeah. And then but then the Ramam also acknowledges that you need to learn from its context. Uh -huh. So yeah. So there there are Rishonim. My point is that there are Mafarshim who say here's the code, like it means this, this, and this. Right. Um, but I I think like it's. You know, either they're going to have a hard time with certain uh, like instances. Like, what was the case? The puzzle we said, Dhamma Banafsho or Nefesh Kopasar Badam, Guadam Hu Banafesh. Adam Hu Banafesh, right? Ram is going to have a very hard time saying that that means the intellect, right? That the Dhamma is in the blood. Is in the blood. Yeah, sure. uh, yeah. Okay, so we stop. Let's stop here for today. I know we're going to do the Malvin. Uh, question about. Oops. Let me tell you what's in store for the next three days. Okay. The next pasuk is the pasuk that defines what a late is. Okay. Now we've done that last year. Late is one of the Mishlaic personalities, uh, the mocker or the scorner. We've done that before, but it's going to feel different when we learn this pasuk than the other pasukim because it's it's like there is an actual pasuk with an idea, but it's going to be more focused on the definition. Also, we have Rosh Chodesh on Thursday and Friday. Okay. Which means that I think usually when we do Rosh Chodesh, we start this year 15 minutes late. So I think what I'm envisioning for the next three days is just spend the next three days. Well, okay, we'll do two on the late thing, but we might need to take a third day and, and on Friday instead of having a QA, and a continue on this personality because this is one of the core personalities of Mishlei. Okay, um, so let's plan on doing that. Okay, uh, oh, so quick summary, quick summary. So what do we get from here? So pretty much similar idea from yesterday, but backed by Rama and Rubain and Yona, that the essential broad subject of the puzzle is self-control. But the two venues for practicing self-control and the two areas where there are the highest stakes are in what you eat and what you say. And therefore, if you're going to focus on, on developing self-control, then use that as your practice arena because it'll pay off in terms of strengthening that muscle, but it'll also pay off in terms of avoiding lots and lots of sorrows. Okay, there you go. Right, have a good day. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks.